Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show. What's going on? Welcome into the Matt Bernier Show on Friday, June the 3rd, down here in Midtown Manhattan. It's a bit of a muggy, rainy day here in the city. Hopefully it's a little bit nicer wherever you are watching. Here on DRF Live, you watch podcast version, YouTube, SoundCloud, DRF.com. You can actually check it out now. It's on DRFTVvideos.DRF.com. So we've got a nice little show lined up for you here. This is kind of the calm before the storm. Obviously, everyone's well aware that the Belmont Stakes is next Saturday afternoon. The third and final jewel in racing's Triple Crown will bring in Naira's own Ernie Munich here shortly to talk about the Belmont, the Triple Crown as a whole, as well as a feature tomorrow afternoon at Belmont Park, that being the Pennine Ridge for three-year-old males on the turf course. But let's start off talking about next week with the Belmont a little bit here. Kind of set the scene for you. Unfortunately, no Nyquist at this stage in the game. He's been hurt. He, had, he Not hurt. He got sick. He had an elevated white blood cell count, however you want to say that. Doug O'Neill taking the, the safe way out, and I think that's probably the smartest way of going about it. At this stage in the game, make sure he's okay. You've got plenty of good races ahead throughout the rest of the calendar year that he can run in. doesn't have to run in this one, especially considering this will be his third big one in five weeks. You will have Exaggerator, the winner of the Preakness and the runner-up of the Kentucky Derby. And, boy, he could really kind of, I don't want to say cement himself as the three-year-old to beat, even with Nyquist winning the Kentucky Derby, but he certainly could. If he could somehow pull off this feat, run in all three legs of the Triple Crown, run second in the Derby and win the Preakness as well as the Belmont on top of the Santa Anita Derby, he'd really be putting together quite a nice resume for himself. So Exaggerator figures to be a pretty solid favorite going into the Belmont here next Saturday afternoon. And it'll be very interesting to see who else not only shows up, but how everyone wants to run. Let's take a look at the, the list of Belmont Probables right now, if we could. Uh, Todd Pletcher's going to send out a couple in here. We know the names. Destin, Stradivari. We'll talk about them in some DRF Plus headlines here momentarily. Sudden breaking news. He ran a good fifth in the Kentucky Derby. Governor Malibu ran very well, sneaky well, in that sort of second-place finish in the Peter Pan a few weeks back. That's the local prep here for this race. And look, it's going to be very interesting to see how many of these horses, ultimately, where do they get positioned? Does Brody's cause, if he runs in this spot, Cherry Wine, they, they seem to be confirmed one-run closers. They're going to need to be much closer. Creator for Steve Asmussen. He had some trouble in the Derby, but again, he's another horse that just seems to have that beautiful late kick. And at the Belmont, it's not an absolute death sentence if you come from the back of the pack, but we, we've seen time and time again, it just seems like you need to have nice sort of tactical speed in order to take advantage going a mile and a half at Big Sandy. There's no guarantee that you have to be coming from the back, but, or I should say no guarantee that you have to be in some sort of a tactical position. You can win from the back of the pack. It's happened in the past, but it just seems to be much more difficult to do in a race like the Belmont than any of these other races where you're going to have a pretty honest pace signed on. It'll be very interesting, too. We talked about Stradivari. We talked about Destin. Stradivari still very lightly raced, as is Destin, but Stradivari simply because he ran in the Preakness three weeks ago, and he ran so well. He looked very good that day, considering it was his first time against graded stakes-level competition. I thought he acquitted himself very well. I think we know that he can handle a wet track, but it's nice to see that Pletcher's going to wheel him right back in three weeks, as well as Destin. Destin's going to be the very interesting one, and I hate to say he's not the wise guy of this, because we'll talk about the wise guy here in a minute. Destin could be the horse, though, that would be vying for sort of second favoritism in a race like this, simply because he took some money going into the Kentucky Derby. Everyone had seen he'd run fast in the past, and there's no reason to think that he can't put himself in a nice sort of stalking position, or maybe even before the place, simply because this is a race that lacks pace. And no matter how you look at it, there really isn't a lot in here, with the exception of maybe a Destin or maybe a Stradivari. I think the wise guy already, and it's kind of, he's been the laughing stock. He's been the joke of this entire Triple Crown season, but guess what? Lonnie is opening some people's eyes simply because he wants to run all day. His antics, they're well documented. I don't need to go into all that. You can find all the pictures of him acting like a fool on, on Twitter. But at the end of the day, Lonnie's a horse that if he can get into the running a little bit earlier, he's shown that he can handle this sort of distance. It's not going to be a problem for him. The way that he ran on in the Preakness, I think that could be a very positive sort of uh, foreshadowing for him. Because, again, at the end of the day, if you can get within striking range, let's say with a half mile or three quarters of a mile to go, considering three quarters mark is going to be halfway in this race. I think you got a puncher's chance, particularly if you're bred to run all day. And if anyone's bred to run all day, it is the Japanese import Lonnie. It'll be very interesting to see how everything shakes down. We've got one week until the Belmont Stakes. Before we get to that, we've got plenty of good racing coming up this weekend here on DRF Live all over the country. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll bring in Ernie Munich from the New York Racing Association. We'll talk about the Triple Crown. We'll talk about the Belmont Stakes. And we'll talk about tomorrow's feature at Belmont Park, the Pennine Ridge. Stay with us here on the Matt Bernier Show. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. 
you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out unprofitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Twelve oh six East Coast, nine oh six West Coast. The Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to introduce one of my buddies here. He's a handicapper for Naira TV. His name is Ernie Munich. He's one of the real proper good guys in the business. You can follow him on Twitter at Ernie Munich. Ernie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Last time you and I crossed paths, I believe, was at the airport in Atlanta, coming back from the Breeders' Cup in November. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. And. Uh... That was a lot of fun to run into you, and we were able to actually, without cameras, with, with, without audio or, or without microphones, able to really dig into what went on that weekend. Yeah, it was a special weekend down there in Lexington. Unfortunately, it's just an odd place to get to, and there's no direct route, so we had to kind of backpedal through Atlanta and then come back up into New York. But exactly. that was in the past. That was about six months back now. We know what happened with American Pharaoh. He's, he's clearly one of the more recent all-time greats, if not an all-time great proper. Let's talk about these three-year-olds thus far this year. Before we dive into the Belmont, let's go back a few weeks and talk about the Kentucky Derby and get your thoughts. All things considered, let's just start off with the winner. Overall, where, what did you think of Nyquist's run, and did you think he kind of lived up to expectations? I think he absolutely lived up to expectations. I think it was his second best race. I actually think his Breeders' Cup Juvenile was his, his best race in that he, what he was able to overcome come and people forgetting how far back and how hung long he was that day. But in the Derby, as you, as an, as a, an expert of pace, surely knows, I mean, he was, he was on, top, on top of that pace early, and he was still able to sustain despite the traffic that maybe exaggerated hit that day. I do believe Nyquist was a deserving winner and the best horse that day if we, from a trip handicapping perspective. Yeah, and you mentioned Exaggerator. He had to tap on the brakes a little bit on the far turn, but he came with his yeah. run. And I think I think anyone that's a fan of this horse has to be pleased with the way that he ran that day, and he obviously acquitted himself well two weeks later. But as far as Exaggerator in the Derby is concerned, do you think it was a matter of, I understand the pace was, was ballistic, do you think if Kent had to do it over again, he would have taken the horse or tried to get him outside rather than try to shoot up inside? You know, maybe it's it. It's so easy to go back and, and, and do the armchair jockey thing. Right. Now, you know, I, I, the pace was fast. I mean, he, he, Nyquist could have backed up under those circumstances or, or certainly or not as not as held as, as tenaciously as he did. Uh, you know, I've, there are jockeys e the equal or the greater of Kent to have made g bigger mistakes under those circumstances. I think it, it, it was what it was. And, you know, I, you know, I can keep it. Kent, in a way, redeemed himself in the Preakness, and we got those fantastic quotes afterwards from both him and his brother. They are quote machines and a lot of fun to listen to. 
Uh, as far as the Derby from a trip standpoint is concerned, were there any horses in there that you felt you could give some sort of an excuse and maybe want to upgrade them next time out, whether it is coming up next week in the Belmont or somewhere else down the road? As far as the Derby goes, there are many in there that I think are being slightly overrated. I think the one interesting horse to me coming out of the Derby is Destin in that he was sneakily close to that pace. He watched that the, the run in front of the grandstand that first time, and you can see the great majority of those horses comfortable on the on the right lead. You see him kind of fighting a bit, a little bit on the left lead. It wasn't a new, he wasn't it wasn't a strangle fest going on by any means, but you can see he's on his left lead. He's done it both ways in the past where he settled into a nice groove early, but here he was on his left lead. Everyone else kind of in the groove on the right. He found a good stop though. His trip wasn't bad. What was good about his performance in my eyes is that he was close to that pace. He switched nicely through the stretch. He flopped back to the wrong lead late. But, you know, given that he hadn't raced in a couple of months and given some some uneasiness into that first turn and then the way he hung in there, he was my favorite of the horses who ran in the Derby. And uh, otherwise, most of those had horses backing into them uh, through the lane. And we'll talk about Destin as well as some other runners here in a moment when we talk about the Belmont. Let's go two weeks back to the Preakness. Uh, overall, all things considered, we already talked about Exaggerator and how Kent gave him a very, very good ride in that scenario. And then, obviously, he had some pace to run at. Let's talk about the pace scenario first off. And, again, we, we are not knocking the jockeys themselves, but, again, it, it's part of our job. It's fair to question decision-making. Do you have any issue with the ride Mario Gutierrez gave Nyquist? Absolutely. And okay. I... I no doubt about it. There was a split second where he could have he could have let those horses go again. When we saw he was able to do that in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, he, this this you know his strength compared to ex- exaggerator is that the way affirmed over Aladar and Sunday Sounds over Easy Go is his push buttonness. His he, he is that I mean I believe he's that amenable to rating an opportunity there. That the, the 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 penny speeds go now. Look, you know, it, 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 starting to win chins, that's a different story. And, and, they, and, you know, and, and, and it came out afterward that Doug O'Neill was in favor of, of, of having him ride that way. So, you know, in a sense, is it fair to blame the jockey when he's riding to instructions? You know, I'll let others decide. But that was an, an awfully, awfully hot pace. And you can see one by one being incinerated uh, by that pace, which is why I, I like a horse out of that race named Stradivari. Yeah, and, you know, we had all talked about it as we were going over the race before and then it, it, kind of the postmortem, if you will, and talking about how it, it just seemed like they wanted to give him the American Pharaoh ride where it said, we're on the best yes. horse, let's go on with it. And, and I don't think they thought that Uncle Lino was going to put up as big a fight as he ultimately did. You know, it, it's, it was really almost as if the, uh, Nyquist was... was was Exaggerator's rabbit, or Uncle Lino yeah. was his was was his rabbit. I mean, it just worked out that way. And you know, this happens all the people get excited that they, 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 they short memory and that uh, wow, he's the next American Pharaoh. He's you know, and he's even undefeated. And just he did send them as you said the way they, they did in the pre. They just put him out there. He's the best horse, and it's either that or you know. But when you start ask the horse to do that amount of work. Early. You are truly asking for trouble. Leach the horse is much more talented than Nyquist. A spectacular bid chasing a horse, gallant best on the backside in the 70 uh, Belmont stakes, which was Ronnie Franklin's disastrous world. I mean, we've seen horses chase speed horses and get and, and, and great horse, a horse like Spectacular Bid, and he got caught. You know, so it, it happens. It's done. Now we move forward, and you know what? I, I, I'm wrong so often, but I'll have a chance, as will everyone else, to put their money where their mouths are, and, and we'll see down the line. Let, let's kind of button the Preakness up, but also lead into the Belmont with the winner of the Preakness, Exaggerator. We already talked about it. Kent D gave him a great ride that day. He had plenty of pace to run at, but everyone always goes back to the wet track. I personally don't believe the wet track moved him up. I just think he's a really good horse. Where do you stand on Exaggerator? Do you think when he gets that sort of off going, he moves up a step, or do you think he's just a proper good animal? You know, I, w- I was listening to your show last week, and I, heard, I know you are a fan of this horse, and or... or, or 
uh, were or are happy still that he's gotten the recognition quote here that he's deserved all along. And I'm with you on that. I, I think he's, he's, he's capitalized. He's an, he's an immensely classy horse. I mean, here, here's a guy who has gone from winning a, you know, a two-year-old stake going six and a half at Saratoga to, to being a, a, a classic winner. He's, you know, he's got, he's got, you know, he's by one of the classiest horses of all time. He's from terrific connection. I am really a fan, a fan of Keith Bissorm. I mean, he's got such an, a tremendous eye for talent and developing horses. It's like I'm really fun watching him. I mean, I wish he could pick out a horse for me if I had the money. He's really just <laughs> tremendous. So now, as far as exaggerator goes, now I'm not. I guess there's a butt involved. I mean, I, I'm. He's caught now three. Can, to me, this, the Derby track was wet. You know, I could be wrong about that, but if you see the overhead, there is a lot of moisture in that track, to say the least. So he is, in a sense, caught three consecutive wet tracks and fast paces. Now, there's some good fortune involved there. That doesn't mean he hasn't counted. He's been fantastic. But when you get hot paces thrice consecutively plus wet tracks, you have some luck. I'm not saying he hasn't been terrific. A lesser horse could not have done what he did. There's no doubt about that. I'm just, you know, you go back to the last time, his last three fast track races, you know, against Danzig Candy, who got loose that day, you know, against Nyquist in the San Vincente. He was terrific that day. I mean, exaggerated could be on the green in the Belmont if he wants to be. He went, se- he went seven eights with the two year old champion with a length off. He was in front of Nyquist early. I mean, you have these images of Exaggerator as a as a you know one run horse who who uh, what a quote that was from Keith Desormo before the Derby goes. Kent's going to be looking at uh, what does he say? Watching cars in the parking lot on the backstretch. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, this is the stuff when you're not, not a horseman. I'm not a horseman. I'm just a loser handicapper. But these are the kind of quotes I love, and I learn, and I can learn from trainers. That's just great stuff. So here's a horse who could be looking at cars in the parking lot on the backstretch. And yet he's on in front of Nyquist going seven eights. So I mean, as you say, it's a very classy horse, but he's got three losses consecutively on fast tracks. It's just an interesting situation to me that he's and, and maybe a chance to win some money. But I know he's very classy and fast and getting better. Formidable, formidable stuff for sure. Well, and as we head into the Belmont next Saturday afternoon, a mile and a half at Belmont Park. You mentioned it a little bit, that Exaggerator has at least shown in the past that he doesn't have to be a one-run closer, but you wonder at this stage in the game, these animals, they get used to kind of doing what they're doing, and it seems like they've reverted to those one-run tactics. You had mentioned Stradivari, who ran so well, I thought, in the Preakness Stakes, first time against Graded Company. Is this the horse that you're going to be looking at most as far as the Belmont is concerned? And also, kind of putting them together, where's the pace coming from in this race? I, I, I'm six. It's what look the, the three horses I like. Who I will are the I think will be the, well for certain. Certainly the two choices. The favorite, of course, will be your Preakness winner. Second choice I think will be Stradivari, and he may be a stronger favorite than you. Well, I don't stronger second choice than you think. You know, I imagine exaggerate depending how Kent is a is a is a character. If he if he senses no no pace, he heck he may if he's galloping out there, he may let him go. You know, I mean he's this is. It's been a, the last time, you know, Kent had a major play in the Belmont Stakes. It didn't go so well. So uh, maybe he may not want to get cute if there's no pace in this race. But, you know, we saw him move in the Preakness much earlier, and we saw the 7-8. This, this horse, I'm not saying he's not a front runner, but he can be fast if you need him to. Now, Stradivari, he, uh, he broke from that from the way outside post. Take a look at it, even though the horses inside of him were not too hot. Just look at all the movement in that race and where the where it was coming from. How he broke from so far outside, had to get used to drop in, then got a little bit lank, then kept fighting close to that hellacious pace, you know, within a few lengths from that hellacious pace, and was still, still giving through the lane. He wasn't beating that much, and he hadn't run in a long time. It was his first stake strike. There's a, I don't know if he might re, is a chance, of course, he could regress off that race. But off that performance, given he's run so well, uh, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's bred to certainly keep going. You know, I mean, if the, if the race were right today, I would, you know, I would probably take a shot with Stradivari, and it's not that brash a selection by any means. 
You know, I'm wondering if Gaston can just kind of gallop out there. Uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to beat the favorite. I lose very often doing that and feel <laughs> stupid afterward. But part of this game and the fun of it is trying to, to do something that maybe is a little bit different and, you know, give the 2.3 people who might be following you an alternative to the obvious. I think this is a nice way to segue. Again, we're joined by Ernie Munich, handicapper for Naira TV. You can follow him at Ernie Munich. We've got a few minutes left here, Ernie, and let's talk about tomorrow's feature at Belmont Park, the Pennine Ridge. And you talk about going back to the Belmont. You want to try, as a, as a public analyst or a public handicapper, you want to try to give the public or anyone else, for that matter, just an alternative. Do you think tomorrow's race goes through a horse and Camelot kitten for, for Chad Brown, who did so well down at Churchill Downs, but had plenty of pace to run out in the American turf? Or is it another horse that's more, more locally based, I would say, compared to the more, more recent runs in a, in a Highland Sky for Barkley Tag or a Hammer's Vision? Or do you want to take kind of a, a new shooter or an X-Factor in a, in a horse like Dresden Hermé? It is it's such a terrific race, Matt. I, I, from my mouth to Slew's ears, I just chilled listening to you talk about it. And there's another horse I'm a little bit interested in who on paper looks too slow. But, you know, one of the things that I'm learning from the crew at Naira TV, and then I mean all of them who regularly outpick me, and I really mean that, I'm not being humble, is that all, all of these characters at Naira TV really try to give alternatives, not just the obvious, which is fine. And you can, again, look stupid going against the obvious. But, you know, what I've, I've developed this thing where, you know, it's kind of cool to try to find something out of the box. And in this race tomorrow, in the in the Panine Ridge, right from the bottom. Well, Hammer's vision looks like he might get Lu- uh, Lucy Goosey Landa Lucy out there. He's coming off that race against Older. He might be out on the lead, but can he go that far? Brian Lynch has been lethal at this meeting. Lethal. One of my favorite trainers. It's just, you know, he hasn't been the 9F, but who's going to run with him? I'm, you know, I'm hoping, hoping that Dresden or May goes. And I'm hoping that, that maybe Azar puts some pressure on him. But I'm deeply concerned that Hammer's vision may get away. Camelot Kitten, kind of perfect tip in that race, but he beat some really good horses. I've heard you talk about Beach Patrol, and I know you're a fan of that horse for sure, and Surgical. So, I mean, those were good, fast horses. You go get Highland Scott. This is a He-Man type of horse. <laughs> I mean, his dam could run all day, Christy with a K. I'm still waiting for him to get a contentious pace. He hasn't even got his table set yet. And yet he's able to sustain those runs like he did last time. Now, I'm not sure how that race is going to turn out. The mighty Moan, the bridal daddy, neither of those came back. I know the, the distance, there was a change in, like, in, in, dyna- in, in pace scenarios and, and, and distances for them. So maybe that race was slightly overrated last time, but he's shown a lot of interest. And he ran huge was here last year on the um, on the inner at Belmont in in the Pilgrim. Dresser Hermé coming from out of town has run some big races there. Cole Provision is the one who was so this is a dangerous term coming, visually impressive <laughs> first time out. Because I mean if you look at his race, I mean, he did have a really good trip and he beat a weak field, I guess. But I mean he really was the only one having it was really only he, him making, having any motion from behind, and his gallop out was gigantic. He was just getting started at the end, and he's got a pedigree to stay to 2019 with the Lemon Drop Kid and King Mambo factor going. So he's very interesting to me. He looks too slow, but I, and then Chad Brown, you know how they can improve exponentially from race to race? I am so excited about that race. It's one of those where I hate to be wrong when it's over because it is so juicy, Matt. It really is. You can go any number of ways, and we're going to a little foreshadowing for me down the road when we talk about the Pennine Ridge here. In a few minutes, I think a live long shot, you mentioned it, Call Provision. This is a horse, like you say, he beat inferior competition, but I'm going to steal a line that Mike Beers used in the past. He looked like a car coming down the lane. He didn't look like a horse. Yes. He looked like he was just driven down the center of the racetrack. Absolutely. And then if any of your followers... Uh, get, get to the head, gets to the replay, so just hang in there and watch him be on the wire. Yeah. Now, there's always this thing that, you know, you have to factor in that who he was running against and, and you know, how fast they ran. And you, everyone, I'm sure all your followers and viewers already know that. But that's what I'm struggling with. I'm probably going to take a shot with him because it was so much, you know, because I he just looked like a really talented horse. But was he too slow? That is the question.
Fantastic feature on a Saturday afternoon at Belmont Park, the Pennine Ridge. Ernie Munich from the New York Racing Association. He's a handicapper from Naira TV. My friend, I appreciate some time. We'll cross paths hopefully soon at the racetrack. I'm, I'll be out at Belmont uh, beginning of July, so hopefully we'll cross paths at that point. I'm sure we will. Matt, always a pleasure. I'm a fan of yours. You walk the walk. A gentleman and a grade one handicapper, when you win these tur money tournaments at the highest level, you are for real. Good luck, and I'll see you soon, Matt. Sounds good, Ernie. We'll take a quick break Bye. here on the Matt Bernier Show. When we come back, we'll take a look at some DRF Plus headlines, and then, like we talked about just with Ernie, down the road, we'll dive into some handicapping for this upcoming weekend. Stay with us. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out some profitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. Twelve twenty six here on the Matt Bernier Show. Just want to thank my guest Ernie Munich from New York Racing Association for coming and giving us some time talking about the Triple Crown, the Belmont, and tomorrow's feature race down at Belmont Park, the Pennine Ridge. Uh, let's dive into some DRF Plus headlines. If you want to take a look at headlines, they're right below the video player. If you're watching on DRF Live, live.drf.com, you need to have a DRF Plus subscription. We've got all sorts of good deals for you. Go to drf.com slash plus to see what we've got for you. Uh, down and dirty, only a few of them, but they're all pertaining to next Saturday's races. Obviously, the Belmont Stakes is what everyone's talking about, but we've got to keep in mind, it's almost, it's almost as if it's a mini Breeders' Cup with all the other big races going on. So let's dive into some of the talk from DRF Plus headlines just below the video player. Dave Grenning earlier this morning, Stradivari and Destin, they both got their final work for the Belmont Stakes. Destin worked with Awesome Gent, who's a decent little sprinter for Todd Pletcher. They went a half mile, according to Mike Welsh's clocking in 49.51 grenning saw the focus for both of them being more so on the gallop out dave saw five eights in 102 and four three quarters in 115 and two seven eights 129 and four almost one minute and 30 seconds flat for seven eighths of a mile so it sounds like destin pretty good workout Pletcher trying to get a little bit of something into him knowing that this is going to be the, the ultimate test the test of a champion trying to get the mile and a half as far as Stradivari is concerned, they went out just afterward. Stradivari worked with Decorated Soldier, a horse that ran unsuccessfully in the Peter Pan. I'm sure there's a chance that we may see him in the uh, Easy Goer Stakes on the undercard of the Belmont Stakes. They went 5 eighths in a minute, 3.29 seconds, 3 quarters, as far as the gallop out was concerned. 115.46, 7 eighths, 129.69. Johnny V was on Stradivari, Javier Castellano on Destin. It sounds like those are going to be the mounts that they both bring into the Belmont Stakes. So they're getting their final tune-up here this morning. They should be good to go. Fingers crossed, knock on wood, going into next Saturday afternoon. Mike Welsh reporting that Governor Malibu got his final work for the Belmont, five-eighths of a mile, a minute and one-fifths of a second. Joel Rosario's aboard. You've got to keep in mind, remember, I know we don't have a triple crown on the line, but you've got to go only back to 2014 where you had Christophe Clement, who was trainer of Governor Malibu, Joel Rosario, rider of Governor Malibu, they both teamed up for a Belmont victory aboard Tonalist. He unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, spoiled the party for California Chrome. Those same connections are coming out here. Different owner, but Governor Malibu works for the Belmont Stakes. Five-eighths of a mile in a minute and one-fifth. Dave Grenning going back. Now, this isn't about the Belmont Stakes itself, but this is about arguably the co-featured event. Of all the other huge events that we've got going on Belmont Stakes Day, You've got the Metropolitan Handicap, the Met Mile, Blofeld and Stanford. They both work together 
for the Met Mile. They're going after Todd Pletcher, obviously. They both worked a half mile in 50 and one-fifth seconds, nearly 50 and two-fifths. They went 50.36. The gallop outs, though, again, for Dave, as far as his eye was concerned, the gallop outs were the most impressive parts of the workout. Sounds like they're coming into it in good order. It's going to be a salty rendition of this race. I never thought I would say Stanford could arguably be one of the choices for the, the, the Metropolitan Handicap, but it seems like he's coming into this race in great form. You've got Blofeld, who no disgrace in some of the races that he's run recently. And then you're going to have a lot of new shooters, a lot of new faces. I say new shooters. Horses we haven't seen in some time, particularly the ones coming from the Kieran McLaughlin champ, uh, camp, I should say. Sounds like Frosted and possibly Marking will be coming back over here, making their stateside debut from their trips over to Dubai. And, and Pletcher may also be sending out Emshawish in the Met Mile. So there's going to be a very good race, among other horses that could be going. Amy's Flatter is possible. Got a whole list of them, a whole slew of them. So all of the latest updates in news and nuggets and handicapping, all of this sorts of good stuff, DRF Plus right below the video player here on DRF Live. Again, drf.com slash plus. See what all the different subscriptions are available for you. Get your fill, get whatever you need, and especially going into this week, going into the Belmont, you're going to want to have all the latest news and nuggets from all of our great writers and handicappers up to the minute. So, again, drf.com slash plus to get in with the DRF Plus headlines. We're going to take a break, quick little breather. We're going to come back and we'll dive into last weekend's handicapping. We'll see how we did and then give you a little bit of a preview of what to come this weekend here on DRF Live. Stay with us the Matt Bernier Show. Does your online wagering platform want you to win? If they did, wouldn't they help you win? At DRF Bets, we're all about raising your game. That's why we give our players the data, tools, and know-how that no other service can. DRF Bets is more than a place to wager. It's a platform to help you play better and win more. Brought to you by the folks who love racing as much as you do. Opened up two and a half lengths. Private Zone's got the lead close to home, and he's all by himself. Private Zone wins the Forgo. 12.33 East Coast, 9.33 West Coast, the Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live. If you're watching live on DRF Live, live at drf.com, thank you. If you watch the podcast version, whether it's YouTube, SoundCloud, or video.drf.com on the homepage, Thank you again. Let's dive into some handicapping review from last weekend. We went over three races last weekend. One from Arlington Park, two from Santa Anita. Let's start off with the Arlington Classic where it was a scenario in which I, I thought we had a most likely winner and we had a live long shot. Let's take a look at that slate. This is a new graphic that we've got for you. The race, the Arlington Classic. thought the most likely winner was Surgical Strike. thought a live long shot or an interesting long shot was It's Not Easy being breezy. Surgical Strike ultimately ends up prevailing as the 8-5 to five favorite. Again, not, a, not an appetizing price. But at the end of the day, if, if we think the horse is the most likely winner, 8-5, to five, you can use him in different ways. You don't have to use him. You don't have to play him to win. You can use him on top in triples or supers, or you can key him in some sort of a multi-race exact or a multi-race wager, I should say. As far as the live long shot, I have no complaints and no issues the way it's not being bre easy being breezy ran. Finished sixth in an 11 or 12 horse field at 50 to 1. This is a maiden that they brought up from down in South Florida at Tampa Bay Downs. Ran greenly in the debut, came up made the move and just wasn't quite good enough. I don't think that's necessarily indicative of this horse down the road. 
I, mean, I think as far as right now, maybe it was a little bit too much too soon, but there's a reason the horse is 50 to 1. And again, I'm more willing to take a shot in a horse like that. It's not easy being breezy at a million to 1. Then take a horse in Surgical Strike, who, although I think he's the most likely winner of the race, again, I don't really want him at 8-5. to five. And again, you can key him on top in an exact or a try or a super or any sort of those wagers. But it's interesting, and you always want to try to mix in some sort of an unknown or some sort of a, a wild card that could spice up your exotics. So most likely winner Surgical Strike. He did prevail at 8-5. to five. Live long shot. It's not easy being breezy. Sixth at 50-1. to one. Suppose you want to call that a miss. We can call that a miss. Let's go on to the Malaire Stakes. That was one of two races down there at Santa Anita, the great race place that we took a look at. thought this one, again, I almost feel a little bit, I don't want to insult your intelligence. Because, again, very intelligent people that watch this show. Enola Gray, I thought was the most likely winner. And, again, I'm not, that's, it's not rocket science. That wasn't a brilliant opinion going into it. But the interesting thing was going to be to see what she could do first time going two turns after smashing in that debut, breaking her maiden at first asking with the 99 buyer speed figure. Michael Rona, take us home. It's Enola Gray, handridden for home. Leads two and a half lengths to all square. The spiral Jetta wandering a bit wide. Hacktivism Cheekaboo is next past the eighth pole. And Enola Gray clear by two and a half lengths. All square running second, sticking gamely to her guns, but simply can't match the very promising Enola Gray. Takes it by two lengths from all square and four lengths Cheekaboo third. Michael Ronan with the call. Look, the filly did very well. She passed this test with flying colors. She earned a 93 or a 94 buyer speed figure. My only concern is, especially if we're just looking at it strictly from a speed figure standpoint, and by the way, she prevailed at 1 to 9. That was no brilliant opinion. Like I said, it was just making it clear that she could be something. The buyer speed figure is the only concern for me because if you just look at it, the rest of the field, majority of them ran career bests by quite a bit. And it's just one of those that kind of isn't sitting very well with me. It makes me wonder if that number's a little bit inflated, that maybe it needs to be closer to a mid or a high 80 than a low to a mid 90. And we'll really find out when she does test deeper water. I don't know right now what the latest or the plan is for this filly. She's a cowbred. I think you've got to try to test some sort of a graded stakes race. And unfortunately for three-year-old fillies in Southern California, you're going to have the champion Songbird undefeated. She'll be coming back here soon. I believe the summertime Oaks is going to be the early plan for Songbird, and it may very well be the next spot for Enola Gray. I'm sure that would be a fantastic matchup, and all of us that are fans, let alone the wagering side of it, us that are fans, be very interested to see how that goes. I'm still going to lean towards Songbird. She's the champ until she's knocked off. I like her. Let's go on to the Snow Chief. It was run just after the Malaire. You could have played a bookend double with this race. I thought the most likely winner was Tough It Out. He was figured to be a shortish price or one of the choices in here, and I thought a live long shot was glory bound. This was a short field of five because we had a scratch earlier on, and boy, it's tough. This was not a race that I thought anyone was a standout by any stretch of the imagination. Mile and an eighth for Calbreds. None of them truly looked like they want it, maybe with the exception of Tough It Out. Let's see how it went turning for home. And six lengths to the big train at the 316s. Gold Rush Dancer takes the lead. A neck to uh, Glory Bound on the inside. And Rallis is now getting into the clear as Tough It Out begins to struggle. Gold Rush Dancer just leads Glory Bound. Rallis is finishing determinedly. Gold Rush Dancer with the lead. Rallis is coming at him. Gold Rush Dancer just in front. Photo, Gold Rush Dancer on Gold Rush Day. One of the nose, Rallis. A fun race to watch. I don't think it was a, a race that we're going to be looking at saying that. Ah, that's a key race, a major effort there for Gold Rush Dancer. Thought the horse ran very well. Thought Glory Bound, my live long shot, the horse that I bet if you were watching here on DRF Live that day. Uh, I, I liked the horse quite a bit, and I was just concerned about the distance. Ultimately, it came down to two things. It was distance and the horse just wasn't quite good enough. Tough it out for me was very disappointing. This is a horse that you just look at the running style, seems like wanted to run all day, and just kind of was flat down the lane. Rallis. I don't know what you do with him for here if you're O'Neill and Redham because at this stage in the game, it just doesn't seem like he has that will to get the job done anymore. He is a grade one winner, but he's a grade one winner in name only. It'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. So I thought my most likely winner, tough it out. He finished third at 2-1 to one in the live long shot. Glory bound fourth at 12-1. to one. Not a great weekend, not a terrible weekend. It is what it is. We'll move on to this weekend because we've got some good racing coming up tomorrow afternoon, particularly here on DRF Live. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we'll dive into three races that we'll have covered for you here on DRF Live tomorrow afternoon, starting at 4 Eastern. Stay with us.
Does your online wagering platform want you to win? If they did, wouldn't they help you win? At DRF Bets, we're all about raising your game. That's why we give our players the data, tools, and know how that no other service can. DRF Bets is more than a place to wager. It's a platform to help you play better and win more. Brought to you by the folks who love racing as much as you do. Twelve forty one East Coast, nine forty one West Coast. The map earlier show here on DRF Live. Uh, let's dive into some handicapping previews for this upcoming weekend. These three races will all be covered tomorrow afternoon here on DRF Live. Myself, Dan Elman, Mike Beer. We start at four o'clock Eastern. We're going to bring you right through. I believe our last race tomorrow is around eight. 15 or 8 30 somewhere in that ballpark you'll be able to see that after the next break when we go and show you the slate of what's to come tomorrow let's start off with the pennine ridge and this is going to be a little bit different i, I come on here very often and talk about my my value line and the difference between a value line and a morning line and the public line the idea is the value line needs to add up to 100 points whereas a morning line adds up to 100 and then the takeout is incorporated so depending on where you're playing or whoever's making the morning line whatever jurisdiction it could be between an additional 17 and really shouldn't be any more than 20 but at the end of the day you get some of these big fields and you can bump it out to 125 or some people fudge it up to 130 but the, at the end of the day the value line has to add up to 100 points 100 percent simply because there are not more than 100 outcomes there, if you're tacking out of 100 percent 100 percent means 100 percent 100 of them so the value line that's the genesis and the idea of that and from now on rather than just talk about it i'm going to throw it up here so these races that we go over here you're going to see my line, what I think the actual odds are. I can't stress that enough. These are not the morning line odds. These are the odds that I look and view as acceptable win propositions on these horses. Let's start off. Here we are with the Pennine Ridge. Tomorrow it's the featured event at Belmont Park. A uh, mile and an eighth on the turf. It's for three-year-olds. I think this is an interesting race, and, and I'm not going to say necessarily a, a most likely winner for this one, simply because you can kind of judge by the way I look at it right now based on my odds. I think the most likely winner, strictly from an odds standpoint, is the number two, Camelot Kitten. The problem is, I know he's not going to be three to one. I believe Eric Donovan, who is the Naira morning line maker, uh, who, by the way, I think is the best morning line maker in the country, he made him, I believe, eight to five. I think that's pretty accurate. I don't, can't envision a scenario in which this horse goes off above two to one. I made him at three to one. That means from a win standpoint, I'm not going to play him. There's no value there for me. That doesn't mean that I won't link him up in a double or in a pick four or a pick three, but strictly from a win standpoint, it doesn't work. It doesn't mesh. I can't go on with him. So that's why I'm going to throw out what I consider to be a bit of a live long shot, and that's the seven call provision. Ernie Munich talked about him. I'm going to talk about him a little bit here. On paper, he's so slow. He's not nearly fast enough. He's about 13 points behind the top runners in this spot. But if you go back and you can pull it up in Formulator, you can pull up replays. And if you go back and watch the replay of this animal, you can also pull up the chart and show, like Ernie said, it was not the best field that this horse faced. But for a first-time starter, and again, I borrowed one of Mike Beer's lines, he looked like a car. He did not look like a horse coming down the lane. It looked like he was a car being driven down the center of the racetrack. And he galloped out like an absolute maniac. If you're looking for a bit of a number, and again, I believe he's 12 to 1 on the morning line, I pegged the 7 call provision at 9 to 1. Now, does that mean that he's a horse that I'm going to be jonesing to bet from a win standpoint? No, probably not. The general rule of thumb is, you know, going along with the public, the shorter the price the public makes, and the public's the best handicapper there is. So the shorter the public makes, the more likely they are to win, and vice versa. The higher the number, the longer the shot the horse is, according to the public, the less likely they are to win. You're just playing strictly with the numbers, and at the end of the day, that's what this game's about. He may not be a horse that I'm loving to play to win, but I'm surely using him in exactas. I'm surely using him in multi-race wagers. I made him a 9-to-1 shot in the Pennine Ridge. Let's move on to the Shoemaker Mile at Santa Anita. It is one of two grade one stakes going on down at the Great Race Place. Let's take a look. Got a field of six in here signed on. And again, you've got to be able to go through. And these numbers may not look all that interesting. Or maybe they are. I have no idea. It depends how you want to look at them. 
A field of six to salty field. I think you can make a case for all six of them, maybe with the exception of the four and the five home run kit in Cape Wolf. I've always been a fan of Cape Wolf. I just don't know at this stage in the game if he's really a viable win candidate. Let's take a look, though. Again, as you can see the odds, and we'll show it to you again before we cut from this segment. Let's take a look at, I think, the most likely winner, the inside runner, the number one heart-to-heart. Let's take a look at his most recent start. This is in the Makers 46 Mile down at Keeneland. And I, like at the end of the day, he's a horse that I think needs to have the lead. He's going to be going a mile here, and you see he's just going to get run down by a very sharp Miss Temple City of Philly for Grand Motion. But the thing we didn't get to see is with Heart to Heart, he had to deal with a horse in Shining Copper, just absolutely hounding him, being a complete pest, and he didn't fold up. And I thought this was a very good effort. This horse is in career form for Brian Lynch. It'll be interesting to see, though, because I'm not convinced that he's going to be all by himself on the front end. You've got enough, enough other horses in this race that can show early foot one of them being Tourist, a horse that I've never been crazy about. But the other one, and you're going to have to work with me here. I'm going quotes, air quotes, live long shot. I think the six Midnight Storm still has a race in him. And if you go back, I can make excuses, but we're going to show you the race that this is the one that makes me still think. If he can get a trip like this, this was in the Sea Biscuit last year, last November. He's sitting just outside of the one horse right now. He's taking over underneath Victor Espinosa, about three path. And he puts the boots to this field. This is at a mile and 16th. He'll turn back to a mile here in this spot. And you can go through his PPs and just look at him. He's finishing. When, when the good Midnight Storm shows up, he's a very, very talented animal. I think we're going to get a much more representative run from him tomorrow afternoon in the Shoemaker. He has the ability to be close. He also has the ability to sit. I don't want Heart to Heart to get too far away. And again, I'm going with the air quotes for a live long shot because we'll take a look at the odds again for that race for the Shoemaker. I'm calling it a live long shot. I made him 7-2. to two. I, I think he's an interesting play at 7-2. He's a horse, can, you know, if we're going to compare him to call provision, this is a horse, Midnight Storm. I will be interested in betting if I can get 7-2 to or greater on him, simply because I think one of his best races is good enough to beat heart to heart. I think 2020 Vision has a big chance. I think Taurus has a big chance. But these are the horses. I think the most likely winner is heart to heart in gate to wire fashion. I think, again, air quotes, a live long shot is Midnight Storm the six. If I can get seven to two or greater on him, I'll play him to win tomorrow afternoon in the Shoemaker Mile. Let's go on to the third and final race that we'll look at for this weekend as far as the handicapping is concerned. That being the Penn Mile from Penn Nationals. Penn Nationals, big day of the year. Let's take a look at the field. Only seven signed on in here. And again, I can't stress enough. This is the first time any of you are seeing what a value line looks like compared to the morning line. It probably looks a little bit jarring, but again, this is what I think of the race, not what the morning line maker who's projecting what the public is going to make these horses. That's what I'm looking at right there, and I think there's a horse in this spot. I've been a huge fan of his for quite some time. Anyone that's paid attention, this is no news. The three Beach Patrol, Ernie Munich brought it up earlier. I think Beach Patrol is a proper good animal. I think he's a very talented turf horse. The interesting thing is going to be now, taking a look at it, he's in the hands of Chad Brown. Looks like he was a private purchase out of the American Turf where he lost by a nose to Camelot Kitten. He now goes out for Jim Cavello and Sheep Pond Partners. This is a very talented animal. He can go forward. He can sit off the pace a little bit. And it'll be interesting to see the dynamics of this race are going to be fascinating to me because you've got a horse in Arrow Force who, I, in a way, I wanted to make a live long shot, but I know he's not going to be a long shot. He's going to take money. People know the name. He's a reputation kind of horse. He ran so, so well in that American Turf considering the pace scenario was ballistic. And he look, he, he paid the price late. I think he's going to be interesting. A lot of people, and the, the real sort of key to this race is what you think of the four Catch a Glimpse. Catch a Glimpse is a filly who's undefeated on turf. She'll be facing the boys for the first time today. And this is going to be the toughest spot by far, including the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Philly Turf that she's ever faced. She has a forward running style, and there are some other runners in here, most notably Giant Run, who I think has to go. He has one way to go, and he's going to be going from gate break. I think that could soften up, catch a glimpse, and she's very goofy. You've seen Dan Elman and myself really, we just hate how unprofessional she is. She has a ton of talent. No one's arguing with that, but I would just, I want to see her be more professional, and I fear that one of these days it's going to catch up to her and get her bit. I think this may be the spot. I think Beach Patrol is the most likely winner. I made him 3-1. to one. I don't think I get 3-1, to one, but he'll be a key in many of my multi-race wagers. A live long shot is the outside runner for Todd Fletcher, Unbridled Daddy. Now, Unbridled Daddy... I don't know what he is in the morning line. I want to say he's probably 8-1 to one somewhere in that ballpark. He had a bit of a troubled trip in his most recent start. That was the Woodhaven. He was down in behind horses, and he didn't quite get a very good trip. I suppose you could make the case that if you flip the trip from Unbridled Daddy to Highland Sky, who's going to be running in the Pennine Ridge earlier in the day, 
You can make the argument that Unbridled Daddy ends up winning and Highland Sky has to deal with more difficulty. I think Highland Sky, I'm sorry, uh, Unbridled Daddy is 4-1. to one. That's what I pegged him. I think he's an interesting play at that sort of scenario. Again, I don't think he's the most likely winner, but I think he is a very logical candidate, particularly because you've got Pletcher at Penn National and he seems to win everything. I think he's a very interesting runner. I may not be playing him to win, but I will certainly be using him in multi-race wagers. Really, in this race, this is the payoff leg of an early pick four, an all-stakes pick four. Uh, really just playing against Catch a Glimpse. I think Beach Patrol's got a big chance. I think Unbridled Daddy has a big chance. So again, most likely winner in the Penn Mile. I think the three Beach Patrol, the seven Unbridled Daddy is a live long shot. We'll be doing this every week as far as these races that I handicap and preview. And we'll also show you in the review now from now on the odds of what I think they should have been or what I've personally made them compared to what they went off come post time. Let's take a quick commercial break as we turn for home here on the Matt Bernier Show. When we come back, we'll give you a little bit of weekend preview. We'll show you what's to come tomorrow on DRF Live. We'll give you just a quick heads up about tournaments here, tournaments.drf.com, as well as our video of the week and the formulator race of the day for today, Friday. Stay with us. Does your online wagering platform want you to win? If they did, wouldn't they help you win? At DRF Bets, we're all about raising your game. That's why we give our players the data, tools, and know-how that no other service can. DRF Bets is more than a place to wager. It's a platform to help you play better and win more. Brought to you by the folks who love racing as much as you do. Say goodbye to your inner caveman. If you're making caveman bets on pick sixes, you could be leaving money on the table. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you build more profitable exotic bets and place them with one click. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker. Be a samurai with your ROI. DRF Bets Ticketmaker helps you cut out unprofitable exotic bets before they happen and be the master of profits. Raise your game with DRF Bets Ticketmaker, the exotic wagering app. 1253 East Coast, 953 West Coast, the Matt Bernier Show, turning for home here on DRF Live. Again, I'd like to thank my guest, Ernie Munich, for stopping in for a few minutes. He's from Naira TV, going over the Triple Crown, Belmont Stakes, and then tomorrow's Pennine Ridge. Uh, speaking of the Pennine Ridge, let's take a look at the DRF Live slate for tomorrow's race. It's starting at 4 o'clock Eastern. Myself, Dan Illman, Mike Beer, we'll bring you right through the Grade 1 vanity. We've got multiple graded stakes going on tomorrow afternoon, as well as a couple of listed stakes. We've got some action from Churchill Downs. We've got action from Penn National, Santa Anita, as well as Belmont Park. Really fun day of racing, just because it's not a Triple Crown day. And say, uh, particularly this time of year, I feel like people, oh, well, there's no, there's no Derby, there's no Preakness, there's no Belmont. It doesn't mean there's not good racing. Good racing tomorrow, starting at 4 o'clock Eastern. Illman and Beer will be in here. And then we'll make the change over after Belmont's nightcap and before the opener at Penn National. Myself and Illman will bring you home through the rest of the day, round things out with... Three consecutive. Well, the Penn Mile is not a grade one. That would be a grade three, but that's all right. With two grade one races, one of them the Shoemaker Mile, and we'll round things out with the Queen Beholder in the grade one Vanity Mile at Santa Anita. Uh, as far as tournaments are concerned, the new site is launched officially, tournaments.drf.com. You can go in there. It's basically been a consolidation project where you've got everything you need, one-stop shop, 
bcqualify.com, nhcqualify.com, drfqualify.com. I believe tomorrow is the last day on drfqualify.com, which again now is tournaments.drf.com, for you to get in and you can qualify for the Belmont Stakes Challenge. I believe that's what they're calling it, or the Belmont Challenge. It's a $10,000 live money contest. It's going to be taking place next Saturday out at Belmont Park. So that's something you're going to want to take a look at. Again, tournaments.drf.com. We have all of the uh, DRF family of tournaments. It's all right there, one-stop shop now from now on. So you're going to want to get involved there as we're going through the races. Have us on in one window, be playing the tournament in the other one. So um, if you're new to the show, uh, welcome. But for those of you that have watched in the past, we get to the video of the week. And it's simple as that. It's not original. It's not interesting. It's the video of the week. The video itself is fascinating, though. They're always good. There's always something ridiculous going on. And this week, we go to Major League Baseball. And uh, anyone that pays attention to Major League Baseball, in Milwaukee, they do like the, the brat races. This wasn't in Milwaukee. I believe this was in Cleveland. I could be wrong. But uh, Jason Kipnis is an all-star second baseman for the Cleveland Indians. And uh, there was some shenanigans going on at the beginning of a hot dog race, the hot dog derby. That's what they called it. And uh, let's let the announcers of Fox Sports, uh, whatever it be, take you home through this. Now, there goes Ketchup in the hot dog derby. Kip oh! got some, and there's Ketchup. Oh! oh, my goodness. Down he goes. But Ketchup is determined to win this too. race. Now, watch oh. this. Now. That's tough. Now, the reason that Kipnis did that, he had to step in. He basically was kind of like the Dark Knight. He was kind of like Batman. Because the part that you didn't get to see in that is at the beginning of the race, Ketchup tripped both the hot dog and the mustard. Cheating. Cheating, cheating. Kipnis saw it. Can we see it one more time? Oh! And there's Ketchup. Oh! oh, my goodness. Down he goes. But Ketchup is determined to win too. this race. Now, watch oh. this. <laughs> now. Yeah. Like the announcer said, determination, Ketchup did get up and ultimately prevail. And really, that's more an indictment on mustard and, and hot dog, isn't it? Because, I mean, we talk about races and going back and looking at charts and saying, well, you know, the horse won but was facing terrible competition. Clearly, clearly mustard and hot dog don't have their, their act together because there's no reason to lose after the, the Ketchup gets taken out in a clear lead. So... That's our fun little uh, video of the week here on the Matt Bernier Show. We've got about a minute left. We're going to sign off. But, again, thank you for anyone watching on DRF Live. If you're watching the podcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, DRF.com, specifically video.drf.com. That's where you can find this stuff. Uh, as far as next week's show, we'll be on after this show, live around 3 o'clock Eastern on Friday. Myself, Beer, and Illman will bring you through the graded stakes action, I believe, probably the late pick four, the late five races at Belmont Park, including two graded stakes. So, again, this show, no different than the Preakness Friday, no different than Oaks Friday. It's only going to be a half hour next week. Down and Dirty, we'll dive into some races. We'll show you what happened this weekend, and we'll give you some races coming up next weekend, particularly from Belmont Park, because that's where, obviously, the big happenings are. And we'll see if Exaggerator can get two legs of the Triple Crown down and possibly kind of anointing himself as the three-year-old to beat going into the summer months. Thank you again to my guest, Ernie Munich. This has been the Matt Bernier Show here on DRF Live.